have a nice one and enjoy. So just going to go to announcements. So this week, um, Monday, 23rd of May at 10 a.m., prayer meeting at the Hayashi's house. Please go. Um, I've heard a lot about these prayer meetings. They're very insightful, and it's a good chance to, to pray for things that you maybe you have in your life or serious matters. Uh, Friday, 27th of May, 7 p.m. is a DP evening study at LG. Sunday, 29th of May, home service. Uh, there's no service next uh, week because it's half service. Um, Monday, 30th of May, and she all pledge service. Uh, Sunday, 5th of June, 11 a.m., we have a joint service with North London Church at Cashby Park in Watford. Also, Blessing Information Day, um, the, the dates and places. So the 29th of May is at Newcastle. Uh, the, ninth, the 4th of June is at Edinburgh in Scotland. 19th of June is at Birmingham. 26th of June is at West Country in Wales. Details are in notice board downstairs. Upcoming Holy Day, a day of all true things celebration. So uh, on the 5th of June, um, 11 a.m., we have a Cashew Park uh, joint service where we also will be celebrating the day of all true things. Um, please bring um, your family, picnic, lunch, sports gear, anything that you can feel free to share and have fun with. Um, hopefully the weather is good, so maybe we can try and pay for that. If not, um, we will be joining them in the uh, Harris Civic Center inside, so you know, we'll all have a service together, don't worry. Um, an evening with uh, Nathaniel Pete and Sebastian O'Connor, um, organized by Youth Universal Federation UK. The date is Thursday, 2nd of June, 2016. Refreshments from six, uh, refreshments, it starts at 6.30, uh, refreshments at six o'clock. Um, place at Lancaster Gate. For more information, please email pa at uk.upf.org. Um, as far as I know about the, inf uh, the, the event, it's um, the question and answer kind of service um, where you can go and they'll be giving some testimonies and stuff. Um, yeah. A one-day seminar on lineage, living a life through the principle by William Haynes. The date is the 18th of June. It's a Saturday. It's 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. in South London Peace Embassy. Um, the fee is three pounds. Please contact Franklin and Cecilia Fortune if you'd like to attend. Um, the third, the, this is a follow-up seminar from the Blessing Day Information. And first and second generation are welcome from 16 years over. Please bring lunch. They will not provide. Um, also, children's summer camp for children 8 to 11 years old. Uh, dates are Thursday, July 28th to 3rd of August, which is Wednesday. Um, it's a very good opportunity for you for kids that age to partake in nice activities over the summer. You get education, you get um, sports and these kind of things. Um, FFWPU European News. If you'd like to get any more further news, please go to the website of uceu.org. Um, where, where you'll find Peace TV weekly updates and Two Parents magazine. There are other workshops available for the summer, so there are European workshops you can, your children can go on. Um, so please contact ESG.org to find all the details. We also have three UK workshops um, this summer, um, a sports workshop, junior and a senior. So the dates are the 5th to the 7th, no, 7th to the 12th of August, which is uh, the sports workshop. It's for any age from 12 to 18 and just because it's a sports workshop, don't think that you know the, your daughters or your sisters wouldn't go, but it's, it's welcome to anyone. Uh, the junior workshop is the 16th to the 22nd of August, and that's from the ages of 12 to 15. Also, 22nd to the 8th of August is the senior workshop. That's 15 to 18. So if you have a child or sibling that's 15 years old, they can choose to go to either or, but they can't go to both. So if you'd like to find out information, please um, Joy, uh, please ask any of the Heart Committee, which is me, Sonia or Liz, um, and Junction for any more information. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome up the, the, the band back on stage. Thank you, Cass. Those announcements were very thorough. It's good. And you have those, uh, all that information on the sheets scattered around. So please free, feel free to take one as well. Um, uh, also, the next time we meet, um, which is planned uh, on the 5th of June, so that's celebrating the day all, um, true day of all things, and we're going to be hopefully in the park. So we're 
yeah, praying for good weather, um, but that's the idea. And it will be a joint um, event um, with North London. So I hope it will be really good. We wanted to do something a bit different and special for uh, one of the main holidays that our community celebrates. So if you can, um, please um, try and make it to that. I don't know where Caspi Park is, but I will definitely Google Maps that. Um, okay. Um, so please rise and let's sing the down my vision.
please take a seat. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Lisa. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, yeah, good morning, everyone. The title of my kind of, I don't want to say sermon, I'll say discussion, is um, Evolve and Dive. Um, and I was telling people before, but actually, it was Evolve or Die, but then I just thought I'd make it a little bit more um, brighter. Um, so, yeah, there's, it's, it, sometimes it might get a little bit technical and a little bit um, kind of either biological or mathematical, so I hope I can explain it. If you're confused, just put your hand up and just say, you know, you don't understand. Because um, Kaya, I, I explained what I was going to talk about with Kaya, and she was like, you know, everyone's not as sharp as me, so you've got to make sure that you explain it. So, and I was like... I'm sure if you understand, it's fine. Um, okay, so um, I did give this kind of similar sermon to um, in a home church um, I gave a few weeks ago. Um, but my kind of, um, it was the demographics is kind of diverse. It was from five years old to 75 years old. So um, this is a little bit more of a, um, a stepped up version. Okay, so... Um, what I want to speak about today is um, how we as humans, we function with this absolute core. Um, and we're kind of in this state, um, well, the world is in a state right now where there's a lot changing um, and there's a lot going on. Um, and in terms of whether that's Brexit, the EU, um, e, not the EU, sorry, the Britain going out the um, European Union or what, you, what we have with Daesh, what we have with... Um, the U.S. presidential elections, and you know, just a few days ago, um, sorry, I forgot the date, were when um, you know all these airplanes getting um, going missing or being um, kind of attacked. Um, so, it's what can we do in this time <clears throat> to center ourselves back to our core? And the ultimate answer would be um, is we have to make an active choice to evolve and thrive. So um, I just want to start with a very kind of heavy-ish question. So um, what or who is God? And I think it's, that's one of the biggest questions that we, um, we've all maybe asked once in our lives. Um, and I was actually asked by somebody um, recently, so what, can you explain to me what or who is God? And this person wasn't particularly um, religious, um, but they see themselves as you know, spiritual beings, so they wanted to know more. So um, I wasn't going to go into anything too philosophical, but I wanted to explain it in a more kind of biological way. So how I explained it to her is, so we have this. Um, so this is the human brain, and that orange bit that you see there is the hypothalamus. Um, so the hypothalamus, um, um, okay, I'll explain it slowly. So. Um, what I said to this person was that God, ultimately, um, the easiest way to see it is God is love. Um, and the science behind my God is love theory is that we all have a hormone called oxytocin. Um, it's a home that it, it's, it's a home. <laughs> it's a hormone that is released from the pituitary gland um, from the hypothalamus. Um, and so the hypothalamus is basically like our metabolic synthesizer. So what that means is. Um, oxytocin is widely known as love hormone, um, and so it is. So it's released with physical contact. Um, so, for example, cuddling, hugging, you get high amounts of oxytocin released with, during sexual intercourse. Um, and oxytocin also plays a part in the contractions of women giving birth. So, um, by the way, I'm a, um, <laughs> my day job is a midwife, so I work... Um, delivering babies on a day-to-day -day basis, but basically when a woman doesn't have enough contractions or they don't have effective contractions, what we do is start them on a oxytocin drip, so it's kind of like a synthetic love hormone drip um, because you need that to, uh, for effective contractions, which I thought was um, an interesting thing to slide in there. Um, and also two hormones play in breastfeeding. You have um, two uh, main ones, which is prolactin and oxytocin. So prolactin is what fills the, the breasts with milk, and oxytocin is actually responsible for the release. So if you don't have enough oxytocin, what you can do is, um, what we say is cuddle the baby or smell something that smells like a baby or listen to the recording of a baby and you get a release of milk. Um, so if you've kind of managed to follow along, you'd realize that oxytocin is released when we love, 
uh, when we have sex, when we give birth, and when we feed our children. Um, so, um, and also the interesting thing is, I was talking to some colleagues the other day, and they were talking about how adoptive mothers as well, um, if they um, have enough oxytocin and prolactin, or of course with medication, with prolactin to produce the milk, but they can, the adoptive mothers also can actually produce milk, um, whether it's not their baby or not, which is, I thought is another interesting fact. Um, and also with breast milk, um, um, so your body knows exactly what your baby needs in terms of fat content, the amount, um, et cetera. And women release breast milk when they feel the surge of oxytocin. So when they hear another baby crying, what they might find is like a release of breast milk and they're like, oh, <laughs> baby, love. Okay, so, so that's how I kind of related, you know, God as love and as this love hormone is oxytocin. So um, if you kind of manage to follow along, so what I just want to say is, you know, we originate from love or God and we, are grow, we grow receiving love and we, we receive, we receive um, these kind of um, nutrition from God as well. Um, and think of it as God's, a God planted seeds of love within us, you know, so while we have intercourse and everything, and then we grow drinking this love. Um, okay, <clears throat> so... Um, just to have that in your mind, just as a starter, taste, taster. Um, what I want to talk about is, so the Hebrew word for sin is actually hamasha. Um, I know sin kind of sounds, it has a lot of negative connotations, but I, what I want to say is, um, what hamasha actually means is to miss the mark, and it's to miss the objective. Um, so I said, let's view this as an archery target. Um, I did archery for a couple of years when I was um, in college. And so where do you want the arrow to hit? And obviously you want the arrow to hit in the center. Um, and the interesting thing about archery is, you know, you can only really f hit bullseye when you have this absolute um, kind of, you know, what we say is mind-body unity. And it's like, as soon as you release the arrow, you know exactly if it's going to hit bullseye or not. And it's, it's a very kind of, I felt it as a very, like, uh, I don't know what to say, emotional or spiritual experience. It's like that there's this moment where you know you're going to hit the mark. And I think it's like that's when you know you experience God as well, when you hit the center, when you hit um, the absolute core. And... Um, so for us human beings as well, so what is the center of our lives? Um, and what I would like to hear is God is our cent then center of our lives. Um, so, um, and the more you hit the mark, the more you're going to be able to hit it over and over again. So, as I said, you know, even in archery, it's like practice, well, anything, everything, um, practice makes perfect. And the more, um, even in archery, so the more you practice and practice, the more you're more likely to hit bullseye. So, obviously, as well, if we center our lives on God, we have to always practice our, our faith in God, our love in God. And, um, and, you know, as we said, the opposite of sin would be... Um, to hit the mark, to hit um, God, and to center our lives on this core. Um, and another important message, what we can take home with this kind of archery target image is, you know, an arrow can only be shot if it's pulled back, and only when it's pulled back strong enough can it reach the target. And I think that's also in our lives, you know, a lot of things pull us back and a lot of negative things happen to us in our lives, but then actually we should take that suffering or take that, um, the difficulties in our life to propel us forwards or to propel us to center our lives back to God. Um, there was one author that said, um, I wrote it down somewhere, let me find it. Yeah, so there's, um, he said, everyone suffers, but let the fire of suffering um, become the light of consciousness. And I think a lot, of, a lot of times you might have experienced, when you experience God, it's when you have suffered a lot or when you have suffered um, so much that you, you naturally find yourself finding God or making yourself back into the center. Um, and also another kind of similar quote is, 
um, let the fire inside you burn more than the fire around us. And I think that's um, another nice little analogy as well. Okay, so I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated. Um, this is my five-year-old slide. Um, so this is how I kind of perceive it as um, a little bit more complex, but this is how I perceive humans. So at the center, what we have, um, whether, you know, whatever scale you're on your spiritual or kind of religious, um, like, radar, in the center we have God or our core or our core values, um, what we say is Heavenly Father. Um, and then what I put as the second circle is Mother Nature or a human biology in the creation. Um, and I'll go into these a little bit in detail. So the third cycle I see as what divides us or what makes us different as humans. So for example, our country, where we come from, our culture, our race, our religion, and on the outer cycle, it is things. So things like money, um, housing, etc. So what we might see is in the center is something that is absolute and something that is unchanging. And as we go out the circle, we see uh, what is uh, more temporary and more changing and more volatile. So just to go into detail, just to make it very clear to you what I mean by my slides, because it might uh, make a little bit, uh, might create a bit of confusion to some people. Um, so in the center, we have the core. So in the core, as I said, we have God or our core values um, or our Heavenly Father. So the core is the nucleus in an atom. Um, no, that doesn't make sense. The core is the nucleus in a cell, or it would be the proton or neutron in an atom, to be specific. But, um, or, for example, the sun in the galaxy. So the core is absolute. It is the source of all life, and it remains as a center, and then we have things that revolve around the center. Um, and what I call the second circle is the co-core. So this is um, the reason why I put this there, is the co-core is what works in unison with the core. However, the co-core is not absolute. Um, there can be alterations. So however, the interesting thing about creation is, um, particularly in the ideas of spirituality and religion, that it, it is the physical dimension of the core. Um, so what people see is, um, so for example, if I explain, the, co the core has been referred to the Heavenly Father. The physical form of the Heavenly Father is to say, maybe you can say is the feminine character, and what I say is Mother Nature. So the world is created to provide this kind of physical, spiritual, or masculine, feminine, or proton neutron kind of relationship, and that's why I kind of binded it. Um, and so the division, so this third circle explains what divides us or what makes us different. So for example, our culture, our race, our religion, our country. Um, and as humans, we're kind of obsessed by the fact that we want to divide each other. There are so many religions or um, kind of um, divisions. Like for example, I don't know if you've heard of, um, uh, there's a lot of things like ne neurotheology, pantheology, pantheism, and all this, um, uh, different religions, like for example, pantheism is like the study of how um, the creation is the manifestation of um, of God, or um, and they they also discuss how they are, they are the they are tolerant of uh, multiple gods. And anyway, it's, it's interesting to see what is out there. Um, but this is basically what makes us different, and it's and I think a lot of the time this is what we identify our identity as. So you know, it's like oh. When we're asked, who are you or where are you from? We say, oh, I'm Japanese, I'm, um, but I was brought up in England. And you go into this long kind of trail about your identity. <clears throat> um, and then on the outer circle, obviously, we have the more temporary things, like the, the money, the property. It what makes an individual even more individual. So our possessions, so it's changeable, it's the products. Um, it's similar to the division circle, but with lesser emotional attachment. Um, so everyone. Good? Okay. Um, so, uh, however, the circles can be perceived as the bird's eye view of a spiral. So do you get what I mean? So what, I, what we had before is these circles, but what I want to view it as is the spiral um, going downwards. And this spiral was kind of um, given to me by another friend who's, she's in this Japanese, relatively new Japanese religion as well, and she explained it to me this way, and I thought, oh yeah, it's, um, it explains it nicely as well. So at the top, absolute, you know, that absolute center, that's where God would have been. Oh, is, sorry, and then the changing things, so that our things is near the bottom, and it's where the outer circle near the, the bottom of the spiral is. So the core remains the core of the spiral. Do you understand that? If you understand Pythagoras and everything, you'll learn, oh, anyway, okay. I'm not going to go into it. But, um, 
Um, and the only way to return to God within our lives is to retire, return to this core, so which is vertical alignment, as I see it. The more effort you make to return to the core, the more upwards you go, and always going closer and closer to the core and God. So do you understand this with a spiral? To get closer to that center, you have to go up, yeah? So you have to shed the things that are at the bottom to go upwards or closer to God. Um, so, like I said, so what is vertical alignment? As we see, I know it's, um, there's probably a lot of things you can go into even in um, the Unification Church about what people say is vertical alignment, but this is how I like to perceive it. So it's always returning to the core, returning to the absolute, and returning to God. So it's basically getting um, back to that center. Um, so... The slides from now are a little bit less scientific, but I'm just, it's, a little, it's just more for interest. So, what is special about the spiral to explain this core idea? So, it is everywhere around us. For example, um, if we, tre if we uh, see trees as a source of life, you know, for oxygen to breathe. So in a tree, it provides us for a source of oxygen. It's a source of life again. So, we, uh, so it's, it's a source of life for humans. Um, and the core of the tree, as we see it, is the trunk. Which, and then it grows branches and fruits. And then the fruits release the seeds, which then makes new roots. Do you, get, do you understand? So you have this kind of like outer, inner, outer image. Um, so the roots are our past and the fruits are the future. And then what will create new roots? It's the fruits of the tree. Um, and therefore it creates a new continuum. Um, so just to kind of sum that up, so basically the fruits will create new roots, yeah? Um, uh, okay, so where is the spiral in all of this? I've made these fancy diagrams for you uh, to make it <laughs> easier to understand. So, you know, um, can you see the spiral that I explained? Um, but I just put it in, in the shape of what the image of a tree looks like. So the core is absolute. You can see that the trunk is always aligned to the core. Um, and also, so the German word, this is just an interesting fact, but the German word for breathing, Atman, is derived from the Indian Sanskrit word, Atman, which means the indwelling divine spirit or God within. So, interesting fact there as well. Um, and so if we lose the core, if we lose the center, for example, if the trunk doesn't grow, there will be no fruits. Um, just the other day, I'm a bit of a gardener as well, and um, I had these um, plants growing, and then it snowed for five minutes, and then it ruined all the stems, and then the roots are there, but because the stem didn't grow, it doesn't create, it won't create new fruits, it won't turn into a flower or a vegetable that was growing. So if we lose the core, um, there will be no fruits, so we lose that continuum. And as in man, if we remove the core, so God from our lives, there will be no fruits, i.e. fruitful offspring. And for example, if, you, if the idea of God is a bit too much, then for example, if we lose our core values, humanity will be lost. And as we have fallen people, we will eventually have a fallen world because we stop this continuum that was made to um, be eternal or be um, self-sustaining. Um, and that's how I see, you know, it's, I think, in this day and age as well, where we have so many things happening in this society, it's, it's a bit ridiculous. It's a bit of a joke, but you just can't laugh about it. And then, um, you know, and you just realize it's like everyone seemed to have lost their core values, and you just see humanity in itself, I don't know, self-destructing. And there was a book I read that there's been five major um, extinction periods in our kind of lifetime, not our lifetime, sorry, in the course of history, um, and they're saying we're very close to a sixth extinction, but then that extinction, it will be due to, the, um, due to man and not natural processes as it was in, the, in, um, in history. So that's why I always say, you know, we have to return to our core values if we want this world to exist for our future generations. Um, so where else have we seen this kind of spiral continuum? Um, so I've turned the, the spiral image into a more like... Um, a more easier spiral. <laughs> um, okay, so, so for example, we see this um, image in sound waves, in heart rhythms, in tornadoes, um, and DNA, for example. Um, so if we kind of just have that image in our minds, um, 
there's this slide. So um, this is a fun example. Kyle was like, this isn't very scientific. And I just thought, you know, it's a bit of fun anyway. So um, the shape of this continuum is so it creates an M and a W. Um, and perhaps, you know, it signifies a man and a woman. Um, and then you have that how a man connects to a woman. And then that's how the continuum goes. Because, you know, that's how we, we reproduce as humans. Um, and so the, the connection of a man and woman continues the cycle of our DNA of eternity of, of this, um, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, I was going to take this out, but I just thought it was a bit funny. But anyway. Um, and if we look at this, you know, the man and woman section, just that little bit. Oh, look, it's also the symbol for eternity. <laughs> so, you know, you have this kind of eternity symbol. Um, I, you can probably tell I'm a very... Um, uh, visual learner, so a lot of visual images for you here. Um, so I read up on the eternity symbol, um, so the infinity symbol it's also called. It shows the equality of opposing forces with a divergent point in the center. It's also seen as a sex symbol in some cultures, bec uh, perhaps because the shape resembles um, reproductive organs, who knows, um, but I just thought it's very interesting. Um, so, back to this shape. Um, how, also, um, how can we create it in maths? Okay, this is, might be a bit, a bit beyond a few people, uh, as in boring. But, um, so we have this y equals sine x graph, which looks like that. Um, and then we have this y equals sine x plus pi. Um, so you're basically just adding pi or minusing pi to make this graph. And then you combine the two, and then when they're combined together, it makes this image. So why am I introducing this graph image to you also? So what's so fan fascinating about pi and that graph? So pi is an irrational number which continues on to eternity. So technically it has no end. So again, this image, it's, it's um, bringing us always back to the fact that we have this kind of DNA image, uh, which is also the eternity image. And for all of you um, who no physics and everything, you'd understand that these waves are actually, all waves are actually spirals. Um, and also, in a graph, we have the y-axis and the x-axis in biology. The y chromosome represents man, um, the x-axis represents woman. Um, so, and then I thought that was also very interesting because if you think about how man connects the vertical planes and how women connect the horizontal planes, um, and we have this idea of Heavenly Father direct from the center, again, this vertical um, image, and then Mother Nature, you know, how Mother Nature is the horizontal, it's like how women as well, we produce the man. It's, it's kind of how um, men create... Uh, Men, off, when, no, men provide a house, but women provide the people that make the house a home, for example. It's kind of how men, you know, mankind or men, they should provide a world in which um, we live, and then the women provide the people in which the world is inhabited. So just to have that idea as well. Um, and it's very interesting because I think in the Unification Church we talk a lot about how subject and object, um, how man is subject to woman or how we are objects to, um, to God. And, and yeah, it's just seeing the parallels in, um, in creation and in the universe. Um, and also an extra fact, um, <clears throat> where else do we see the pattern? In the galaxy, the whole solar system moves up and down within 500 light years distance above and below the galactic plane or galactic equator. So I didn't know if you know that, but apparently it does. Um, and again, it's not just this spiral. It works in a, in a continuous um, spiral continuum. Um, so in all these examples, we see that they only function with a core which influences its direction. All of these things need a central core in which it functions and in which it um, circulates. Um, so... Um, and so, okay, so now that we understand that we have this core, how do we always return to this core? Um, we must make a habit to center your decisions on this core. So we must center all our decisions to center on God, on back onto love or back onto goodness, or whatever you want to see your core as. Um, and for example, so who teaches your children or your grandchildren or um, whoever about God or core values? Um, you know, for example, even in this church, we don't even have, you know, 
very fixed Sunday services. Um, and we have one wado. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love my one wado, and I did kendo as well, so I love this whole... Um, yeah, but to be honest, it's just exercise at the end of the day. Um, and it's... Um, and it's like, you have to have this spiritual idea as well. It's like, for example, you have an obese person. You, and you know, for example, okay, we send our children to summer camp or these heart workshops, and there's a lot of them, and it's great. Oh, there's so much activity going on. But to be honest, that's like two weeks or three weeks in your year. And I'm sorry, but that's like sending an obese person to fat camp and expecting them to be, you know, healthy, fit people. It's, so you have to have this habit of you have to make it, you know, a normal thing in your everyday lives to be able to practice it because it just doesn't make sense that you have it once or twice a year and you think that you've done your quota for, for love or, I mean, to understanding spirituality or God or um, the, the teachings in any kind of theology. <clears throat> and I think, um, you know, as your father said, it's the family is a school of love. So within your family, you should make a proactive, um, like a proactive... Um, change or proactive kind of awareness um, to always have core values as your center. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, perspective and how we must create an environment conducive to God or love or to our core values. Um, so Eckhart Tolle, um, he said, the ultimate purpose of human existence is to see that you cannot find yourself in things that continuously pass away. So, for example, my outer circles. And Jesus also said, you have to deny thyself, so deny the things that, make, that you think is your identity. So, for example, these monetary things, these cultural things, or these religious barriers or cultural barriers, you have to deny thyself. And you have to have a connection to the innermost core of yourself. Um, and he says, in order to survive in a world of constant change, we must evolve or die. And then I rephrase that to evolve and thrive. Um, and Bruce Lipton, um, he's a very interesting person who studies epigenetics, but I'll talk about that later. Um, he said, we can only control our lives by controlling our perceptions. And I think perspective is one of the hugest things that as we as humans struggle with. So I'm... Um, because I just want to show, in life, perspective is super important. It's not always about what you see, it's about how you see things. So I'm going to give you a few examples that I also um, like to say. So we have this image here. Um, at first glance, it looks very similar, um, but who can see the difference in the two? Okay, a few of you. Okay, for those that can't see it, so what you can see is that actually... Um, the left one is a poor man, so you have this man who has this kind of sack, and he's holding a sack, so that's probably like his possessions on his back. And then the rich man, you, have, you see this man with a high hat with a big belly. Um, so at first glance, things may look very similar, but actually when you look further, um, you find that it's very different. Um, another very popular one about perspective is this one. So... Um, I know a lot of people have seen this. So who can see the, um, two images? Yeah, so a lot of you. Not all of you can see two images, but who can see the young lady looking backwards? Okay, and then who can see the old woman? And then who can't, who's struggling to see either? No, you've all got it? Okay, so this is a quite an easy one, where it's, um, again, at first glance, you might see one, but then your eyes kind of adjust to another. I know there's a few people still like, what? I can't see it. But um, um, yeah, anyway, I can show you later. So there are two images in this one picture as well. So very recently um, on Facebook as well or on, over the internet, what went viral is about color perception as well. So um, this jacket. <laughs> okay, basically, I see, okay, who sees this as blue and white? Okay, and who sees this more as like a green and bronzy color? Exactly. So, even in this room, we're completely divided. Some of us see blue and white, some of us see green and gold. Kyle saw blue and white, and I clearly don't see it. I see green and bronze. Um, yeah. And then, see, exactly, some people are like gray. Okay, and to be honest, this color is really bad on the PowerPoint, but anyway, you get the idea. So, even in this very room, we have... Um, this like this confusion and this divide and you're like what's wrong with the other person it's like that's the color I see um, 
So with this image, actually, I looked on the internet. Some people can see blue and white. Others can see black and brown. Uh, with some adamant, they could see green and gold or green and brown. Anyway, so it's all these multitude of colors that we all see. Um, and I kind of did a little bit of research about why we see this differently. Um, and actually, it's explained through something called color constancy. So this ability ensures that the perceived color of an object remains constant despite changes in the illumination conditions. That means the context or surroundings in which an object we are looking at appears in influences our perception of its color. So it's actually the, the, um, the light that we perceive around it which affects the color what we see here. So for example, you know, that's giving us a clearer indication that our environment can really change what we see in our lives or what we perceive in our lives. Um, other research shows different um, Differences in the way we each perceive color doesn't change the universal emotional responses we have to them because it is more the wavelength of the color. So anyway, in this example, what I, try, what I wanted to kind of put across is, um, so you can't teach a colorblind person to see color or we can't teach a person, like for example, I can't say to my sister, you know, are you blind? This is clearly not blue and white, but then, um, but actually, no, we, we have to understand that we're, we're different people and we see differently and we perceive things differently. And I think the most important thing is to take home from this is that it's not what you see in life, but it's, um, it's how, you, how you live life or how you perceive life which makes the biggest difference. Um, and there are a lot of times in life where we can't comprehend, say, why doesn't, why doesn't someone see um, something so clear to one um, so differently to another? And it's only when we can see from another perspective that we can truly empathize or understand. Um, and it's this whole idea of you have to seek first to understand before trying to be understood, because otherwise there's just going to be this continuous battle. And it's your perspective is always limited by how much you know. So now that you know about color constancy or, or you know that we see or perceive light differently, then that's, you know, then we stop that very, it's a small example, but you stop that judgment of, Oh no, they're not seeing things differently. We just, we're just perceiving things differently. Um, and there's a very um, new study um, within the last decade of the study of epigenetics. It shows that a cell's life is controlled by the physical and energetic environment and not completely by its genes. Um, it is a, so, uh, yeah. Um, I'm going to explain it really simply. It is a single cell's awareness and perception of the environment which decides its life as a cell. So Bruce Lipton, he's, um, he studies epigenetics very closely now, and, um, and he worked in the cloning of stem cells, etc. and he realized that if he changed the environment that these cells were in, um, he could turn the cells into bone, or if he changed the environment again, he, the same cells turned into... Um, uh, fatty liver, or like fatty cells. So just by changing the environment in which the cell, in, cell is in, it changes the cell completely. Um, and also they realize that when two people become entangled, so one person will conform um, to the energy of the other person. Um, and it's, um, there is this, um, you know, the Darwinian theory about how it's um, survival of the fittest and everything. Um, and there was a lot of focus on Darwin's theory about how, how it's our genes that pre predetermine how we live our lives or how our lives are lived. But actually, there's a, um, there's a person who studied about 50 years before um, Darwin. I think his name was Lamarck. I know that's a philosopher's name as well, but anyway, I'm not too sure. He, um, his study is coming out much more prominently in studies now, and he said that no, it's not just our genes that predetermines how our life is lived. So for example, if your um, father had cancer or if your father had a very short life or if he was bold or, you know, that we are destined to live that life, but it's actually not the case. Um, and they're saying more actually our environment, um, it, that's what determines our lives more. And they're saying, so for example, hereditary diseases, only 2% of um, diseases as well are passed on from mother to child. and um, and for example, I mean, of course, things like sickle cell thalassemia, they're blood disorders, they're very um, entangled, well, uh, they're very, um, 
um, hand in hand with genetics. But so, for example, cancers or even breast cancer, what they thought was, you know, as soon as your mom has it or ovarian cancer or things like that, as soon as your mom had it, you, you're basically told that you're going to have it in your lifetime. But actually, they have found out that now breast cancer only, so 95% of these aren't gene determined. It's actually environmentally determined. But because you place yourself in an environment so similar to your mother or to your sister, that you actually end up having these cancerous traits. So, for example, you know, if your mother was a smoker and had breast cancer, maybe that is a predisposing factor, or maybe it's the diet, or maybe it's where you live, maybe it's the temperature, who knows? But that's what they're finding out now. Um, and so I think we also have this kind of lineage, lineage idea in religion, but I think it's, yes, our ancestors may have made mistakes or ancestors have made certain um, decisions that make our lives difficult, but actually we have that proactive energy or proactive uh, responsibility that you can actually change how your life is lived as well. And um, so we have to be proactively, um, proactive in changing our environment internally and externally. There's also a new study of neurotheology. I don't know, I could talk about, and this isn't what I was going to talk about, but anyway, there's a study of neurotheology as well. So neurotheology, it con concentrates on how the neuron is connected to um, spiritual religious beliefs, and they also found that people who pray, um, they find that their, their brain... Um, is larger or it grows as you pray. So, or for example, meditating um, or these kind of self-reflective um, practices, they actually make you grow as well. And I think an interesting thing about, um, you know how I said oxytocin is released in breast milk? So breast milk is actually a very, very super powerful, I'm gonna say like medicine, because basically it reduces everything you can probably think of. It, reduces ovarian cancer, breast cancer, like I said. So if you think about how, you know, the more you feed your child with love or God, um, and actually it reduces the risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, it reduces the risk of childhood cancer, diabetes, um, you know, skin conditions, eczema, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's like a whole list of it. Um, and actually it increases your IQ, it increases... Um, these cognitive developments and it, it increases a lot of these things and you just realize you know if you see the god is love is hormone oxytocin then you see actually the more you feed your baby with the breast milk the more you see that um actually it reduces these external factors so again if you think of an internal factor the more you feed yourself with god god or love or core values or if you live a good life then internally as well, you're kind of more healed. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people focus their, their lives so strongly on spirituality or religion, because you feel more healed, you feel um, more complete and things like that. Um, and just a few examples about how changing environment can change the, um, change the main kind of um, center or core is, for example, there's a... Um, there's a quote that if a, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So, like I said, you know, I grow my vegetables, and um, I recently brought bought a like a port disposable greenhouse, and actually the the flowers that are in the greenhouse. Um, thrive much better than the ones that were outside, and the ones that are in my house grow even better than in my greenhouse. And you realize that. You know, all these seeds are probably from the same kind of, um, like, collection of plants, but actually it's the environment that you put it in which determines its growth. Um, yeah, so, for example, you know, the grass is not greener on the other side. You know, I hate that line. It's the grass is greener where you feed it or where you give water. And it's like, you have to make that proactive, you know, you have to feed things to make it thrive. And there's another example from a movie called Tomorrowland. So there are two wolves and they are always fighting. One is darkness and despair and the other is light and hope. And which wolf wins? It's the one you feed. Yeah, it makes sense. The one that you feed, it will be stronger. Um, and I think it's like there's a lot of these, these examples everywhere. There's that kind of um, thing about fear. Fear can be spelled as, um, you know, Fear everything and um, what was it again? Fear everything and something about 
Anyway, the other one is fear everything and something like bad, or it's face everything and rise. And I think it's like there's that. There's always a different way you can change it. Just as you, when you change your perceptions, it changes the um, the direction. Um, so Stephen Covey, he um, his book. He also says, we can only achieve quantum improvements in our lives as we quit hacking at the leaves of attitude and behavior and get to work on the root, the paradigms from which our attitudes and behaviors flow. And obviously a very, very um, popular quote from Gandhi, he says, you know, be the change you wish to see in the world. And, I'm, and that's one of the quotes that I really um, love because it's, you know, don't expect change to happen. Don't expect that because you're, you know, you have problems in your family that, you know, somebody else is going to sort it out. You know, true change only comes from yourself or from inside. And um, yeah, so um, just to kind of... Um, go on. Yeah, so back to this kind of image of this circle that we have. Um, so I was having this discussion with my dad the other day and, you know, I was saying, I don't really identify myself with a religion. I don't identify um, the Unification Church much so as a religion. Um, I see religion, it should only be like a way of life or a, um, a path which connects us to our core. Um, and then, you know, you have to pose the question to yourself. Um, I know Uncle William said a very similar thing, but if somebody asks, what is your identity? What are you going to say? Are you going to say that, you know, you are Japanese or you are Indian or you are Hindu or Muslim? Are you going to say you are this church or that church? Uh, or are you going to say um, that essentially my identity is that you are a child of God or you know, you lived with a culture of heart, because um, I think that's what we have to kind of always focus our, um, our idea to. And I think too many times we always identify ourselves in things that are always changing, and these things aren't absolute. And if something, and I think that's why we suffer so much as humans, that when we lose something in these outer circles, or if there is a shift in these things in these outer circles, that we, f we feel like we have, like, I don't know, we've had such a great loss. Like, for example, you know, even in, in this religion, well, in the Unification Church, where there's a separation between, you know, this party or that party, and you just think, and then people are removed, they, they feel hurt by it, they feel very emotional reactions, but actually you shouldn't be moved by these things. It's if you have a very strong conviction that you are a child of God and that is your identity, then you shouldn't let these things affect you, you know? And when people are racist, it's like, and when people make racist judgments and you're so hurt by it, but actually, you know, don't identify yourself as just one race. You know, I'm Japanese, but I was born in England. Do I see myself as Japanese or English? Well, to be honest, we, um, people, you might know if you're half something or half whatever, or you were born and raised in different countries, that you don't actually, you're not your culture, you're not your religion, you are what your life experiences make you. So make your life experiences based on God. Make your life experiences based on core values because um, I think that's essentially what your identity should be. And, and it's like with all these people who get hurt by such easy things, it's like you have to say to yourself, actually, what is your identity? What do you identify yourself with? Eckhart Tolle in his book, he always mentioned the fact that, you know, all these things in your outer circles it's just your ego. It's what you identify yourself as. But once we, own, once we identify that our, our identity is actually our inner self, our inner spirituality, then only then you have nothing to lose. It's like, for example, you, um, there was, he used an example that there was a woman who was terminally ill um, coming to the end of her life, and she had... Um, um, and somebody um, stole her ring that was passed on to her through generations from generations, and obviously had this very strong emotional attachment to it. Um, but then Eckhart Tolle, he said to this woman, but does that change who you are? It's like, yes, it might um, you know, change your possessions or change your emotional attachment to these things, but you're coming to the end of your life and you, you've lost this ring, but does that change who you are? And then she said, actually, you know, no, it's not. I'm not going to, when I pass away, she's not going to take that ring with her. So what are you going to take into the, into the spiritual world? Or what are you going to take, um, or what are you going to pass on in terms of, you know, it's like people are so, it's like, oh, I want my dad to pass on, you know, money or these like, 
things like you hold on to attachments, but actually you have to pass on these core values to your, your children. <coughs> um, and yeah, so like I said, make an, an environment conducive to um, a life based on core values or, you know, go back to your center, go back to what makes um, you a good person or who do you see God working through? And I just want to talk about, um, I'm kind of near the end because I know it's um, nearing that time, but um, I'm just going to give you some examples of who I see very close to God or who I, who I really um, experience God through and my, the core values, you know. And by core values, I have a page of things that I really like, like, you know, anyway. Um, about It's about humility, it's about love, and it's about acceptance, and it's about forgiveness. And um, so one of the examples is my Japanese friend. She's, um, yeah, called Natalie. So we were um, in Japanese school together, and she got leukemia when she was... Um, 12 years old, um, and it was to the point where, um, you know, they said if you discovered it any later, you would really have not survived. Um, and then anyway, she had a lot of treatments, and she even to this day, she has problems, um, even if it's, you know, um, eight years on or 10 years on. Um, and, you know, at the same time as, as battling leukemia, um, so her parents were going through a divorce and everything, and she was anyway um, quite hit by rock bottom. But I think one of the things that she said um, growing up once, she was like, if I was to, um, if my friends were to have cancer or to, to have the leukemia or to go, what, through, to go what I did, I would rather have it again. And I think it's that heart of, she's always, she has this heart of, you know, if my friends don't have to suffer, then I will suffer for them. And I think that's, it's a very, um, it's that idea of, you know, Jesus on the cross. He is every man and he is every woman of, um, you know, of that I will take your pain and I will, um, yeah, anyway. So, um, and another person, um, so my partner, so he, um, <laughs> I'm a very stubborn person. I get really frustrated or ang angry at some situations irrelative to him but you know as women we as one, once we're angry we, we focus our anger on everything and anyway so when, in terms of when I'm super stressed I'm um, sorry um, I take it out on him and I um, anyway um, you probably know how it is um, but what he does, he actually just starts singing like Christian songs or he just um, he's not trying to annoy me you know he he does it as like our kind of um, uh, what do you call it, like personal healing. And then he actually just start, keeps praying and praying and praying. And then he's always like, he always talks about, you know, ah, oh, thank you God for this, like, for this wife. You know, she can be crazy, but she's great, you know. <laughs> and I think it's like, it's that. And he just keeps praying. And I'm just like, why, stop annoying me. It's like, because you know, it's, you can imagine, it's a little bit annoying if this person's not listening to what you're complaining about. But then he just, he doesn't listen. And he just prays and he praises God. He's like, ah, oh, thanks God for this day. Or, um, and, he, and he sings, I don't know, the other day he was singing Amazing Grace. And I was like, oh, um, anyway. And um, yeah, it's just that idea that he always returns to God and he always returns to like this goodness in him. And my whole family t like say that he's like an angel, and he is. And it's it's because he always he knows that he doesn't associate um, these external things too much, and it doesn't let him get him down because he has a very good, true conviction in himself. He's a very person. He's a person who's very true to himself. Um, that you know, this relationship isn't just me and you. It's a relationship me, you, and God in the center. Um, and obviously, so. My next person is my dad. So um, this is him. So um, on the left, um, this is when we were having um, Anshil. Um, and then my, my mom had um, damaged her back, so she couldn't um, stand and pray with him. So then my dad was like, OK, let me pray. And then he, you know, instead of even going on the sofa or just holding her hands, he went on the floor. And he's that kind of person where he will always um, raise people up above himself. He's like the most hu humble person that I've ever met. Um, and this picture on the right was um, after a Sunday service that he gave, um, I think, two weeks ago. Um, before he had his lunch, before he did anything, he, um, so he finished his sermon and then he went outside and he was picking up this rubbish. 
And I was like, <laughs> anyway, I was taking pictures and I thought it was really cute. But then it's, um, yeah, so he's, he's also a very God-centered man and he's a very humble man and he's very, um, yeah, and he scarcely gets very, it gets angry at all and he's a very calm person because he also has a very good um, heart which is very centered on God and I and he was and my parents have always been that kind of they have been my vertical parallels to God and also my mom so this is her with her multitude of food um, and I think at first glance it looks a bit um, yeah anyway but actually this these images are um, on Thursdays, she goes cleaning. So she has, my mom has all sorts of jobs and um, she's a bit of a workaholic. But um, on Thursday, she goes cleaning and I go cleaning with her sometimes when I don't have work in the hospital. And then um, she uses the money that she makes to, um, to buy a meal for, for herself and me. And then she uses the money, they, you know, she uses all the money that she made in the morning just to have a meal with me. Um, and I think that's also a very kind of sacrificial love. And I think a lot of times it's like we make money or we have these monetary things and we, we keep it to ourselves or we use it for ourselves. But she's also, she's a very, I have money, let's use it or let's, you know, spend time together. Um, and I think that's also a good kind of example to have. Um, so just to end, um, yeah, so like I said, you know, we all see differently, we all love differently, um, we are all different, but ultimately our differences, it's actually what makes us all the same. Um, and we should all understand that we are connected by this core, um, and, you know, it's everywhere around us, and we should just look at nature um, uh, to be living proof of that. And, um, yeah, and it's just... Um, you know, because I, didn't, I say I don't really identify myself in a religion, or I don't identify this as a religion, um, when I talk to my friends who are in all sorts of um, religions or organizations or whatever you may see, you know, I say that um, I believe in your truth and my truth is your truth for, you know, the truth is absolute. Um, and yeah, so then it, it becomes the end that evolve and thrive and you know don't just survive in this world so thank you that ends it